Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us once again on our flagship program, Guest of the Week, a program where we engage uh, top personalities who have made their marks in several fields of human endeavor. My name is Shafiu Suleiman. And on the platform this afternoon, we are joined by one of the frontline presidential aspirants on the platform of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Barista Kabiru Tanyamuturaiki, a senior advocate of Nigeria and the title holder of the Namasaneng Gwandu and Zaruman Kabi. He is also a former Minister of Special Duties uh, in the past regime of President, former President Gulok Abele Jonathan. He is also the Chairman uh, Forum of PDP Ministers in Nigeria. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on the platform. Thank you very much. Hello, viewers. Right, uh, as a tradition of the program is, uh, we want to get a brief of your biography. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as you said, my name is Kabir Tani Mutaraiki. Oh. I'm a lawyer, I'm a senior advocate of Nigeria. Oh. I was born in Nasarawa area oh. of Beninkebi, oh. Beninkebi local government area in Kebi State. Oh. I attended the Nasarawa primary school. Oh. Then I proceeded to the prestigious Korean College area. From there, I attended the State College of Art and Science Sokoto for two-year IJMB program, after which I proceeded to University of Joss and Joss for my Bachelor of Laws LLB degree. Thereafter, I attended the mandatory mm. one-year professional course in the Nigerian Law School, Victoria Island, Lagos. Mm. At that time, the campus was not deregulated. Right. Uh, after that, I also did the mandatory one-year NYSC, and then I've been, since that time, engaged in very active private legal practice. Like I said, I've risen to become a senior advocate of Nigeria, which is the highest pinnacle any lawyer could attend to mm -hmm. in Nigeria today. Mm -hmm. I'm also a notary public. I am uh, also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. I'm a fellow of the African Business School and several other professional and non-professional organizations. I've had the privilege of serving as a director of Bank of the North, the Fund Bank of the North. Mm -hmm. I served mm -hmm. as the chairman of Nigeria Copyright Commission. I've served as a minister of the mm -hmm. Federal Republic of Nigeria in charge of the Federal Ministry of uh, mm -hmm. Special Duties and Governmental Affairs. Mm -hmm. I had also served as the supervising minister of the Federal Ministry of Labor and Productivity, in addition to several other ad hoc assignments mm -hmm. that uh, I've had the privilege mm -hmm. of being uh, called upon to do in right. this country. Of course, I'm married. Mm. <laughs> well, yes, you've done uh, so much in telling us, you know, what you've done in, in the public space, especially in the civil service. Mm -hmm. But you haven't told uh, tell us, you know, uh, how you got the traditional titles of the Masenung Gwandu and the Mazaru Mankepi. Well, the Masenung simply means uh, a repository of knowledge. And the fact that I had risen in my choosing vocation to the Zenit by becoming a senior advocate of Nigeria means that I'm highly knowledgeable because the legal profession is about knowledge. And so the Emir of Gondu felt that uh, I needed to be honored with that uh, mm. very, very prestigious title. Mm. Because one thing that Gondu Emir read, historically mm. and traditionally, mm. has been known and respected for his knowledge. So for me, to mm. be given the title of the repository of knowledge of that Emir mm. is something that's really very, very endearing and hard moving to me. Mm. And then because I've been able to be the first lawyer from the former Northwestern state to become a senior advocate of Nigeria, which is comprised of about four states, mm. to be the SA, to be an SA. Mm. Also means that I've done a lot of things mm. that will so, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, how, how, how do you say? Uh, uh, the, the, the development. No, not necessarily. Yes. That one has been able to do something that is extraordinary. Let me say that. Mm. Something that is extraordinary. Mm. And so that was why also the Emir of uh, Kami Arugungu mm. that gave me the title of uh, Zaruman Zaru Kabi, mm. which usually is a title that is given to heroes. Those who have done things mm. that have added value to the lives of people. Mm. Some who have done things that are heroic mm. in nature. So this is the, the, the history mm. and the story behind the two titles that I have received. Right. Uh, Nigerians, uh, uh, you know, mm. a lot of Nigerians, by me looking at some of your billboards, mm. would say, this is charming. Yeah, we have a presidential aspirant, even though not that known, but the, the posters, the billboards are all, all over the country, for instance. Uh, but then most of them haven't heard from you. 
Uh, what exactly is your motivating factor, you know, to run for the presidency, uh, though to aspire for the candidature uh, for the presidency of the, pre of, 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 of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Uh, we'd like to get to know that. If uh, three years ago mm. anybody told me that I would be an aspirant, mm. I, 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 I will doubt it. Mm. But today we find ourselves in a situation where mm. indeed things are not working in this country. And because things are not working in this country, mm. then it behoves on us as an opposition party mm. that Nigerians now believe can do so, can save Nigeria from imminent collapse. So mm. we must try to get people that have capacity. Mm. We must get people that have knowledge and have experience mm. that will be able to do things differently. And mm. so when our party sat after mm. we've lost the election, right. we now done the presidency mm. to the north. Mm. And so leaders of the party, not just of us that were restricted in the north, but leaders in the party across board felt that it mm. is important for us to mm. be able to beat APC, mm. which is today the party in government, as a result of the stupendous propaganda mm. they have done. Hmm. making a lot of promises, unbelievable promises to Nigerians hmm. that we will need to pull them out of those make-believe propaganda hmm. to the land of reality hmm. and get them squarely. And so to be able to do that, hmm. we will need somebody hmm. that will have certain capacities and criteria and qualities hmm. that Nigerians will easily believe. Because now Nigerians have found themselves in a situation where they are not just going to look at the party that is sponsoring a candidate. Mm. They will have to look at the candidate himself or herself. Mm. Look at their antecedents, look at their pedigree, look at their knowledge, their education, mm. and then whether or not there are people mm. that could strengthen the bond of relationship between different nationals of this country, or mm. there are ones that are going to further divide and then strain their relationship. And so, mm. in getting people that will fit into mm -hmm. this, this, this criteria. Mm -hmm. So a lot of leaders of the party felt that, look, I need to come in. I need to come in and, and show interest also. And so I had to do some consultations with critical stakeholders, both in and outside the party. And I felt that, mm -hmm. just like any other Nigerian is today, I'm equally concerned. And if Nigerians, particularly leaders who know my party, feel mm -hmm. that I have what it takes mm -hmm. to be able to come and assist the process, of saving and rescuing Nigeria, then so be it. So mm. that was why today I'm mm. in the race. Yeah. I'm not only in the race, mm. but I'm one of the leading contenders. <laughs> yeah, talking about, you know, uh, your interface with uh, critical stakeholders, uh, some are looking at you, the influence, you know, perhaps the influence of your former boss, the mm. former uh, President Goodluck Abele Jonathan, and some, some, you know, his political allies. Mm. Uh, how through is this, uh, you know, in terms of bankrolling your, your, your aspiration? <laughs> well, let me say that uh, President Jonathan mm. is not only my boss, mm. he remains my leader. Mm. And he's one fantastic human being mm. that as soon as you get to know him, mm. you cannot help liking him and liking him forever. Mm. When I was making consultations, I mm. consulted him like I consulted other former leaders in this country mm. and other leaders. And he advised and prayed for me just like others did. Beyond mm. that, I will say with all sense of responsibility that President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan and GC Ever is not bankrolling me okay. and is not giving me uh, any aspect or portion of my finances. Beyond moral support. Beyond moral support, which mm -hmm. is given virtually everybody, mm -hmm. and which I'm getting from other leaders also mm -hmm. who are at the same level with him. Mm -hmm. But let me say mm -hmm. everywhere in the world, politics involves money, mm -hmm. and people raise money. And that is why even mm. our electoral act and indeed other laws mm. agree that candidates must raise funds. Mm. So what is different in my own case mm. is that because a lot of people believe in my candidature and so they are keen into it. So there are a lot of things that ordinarily I will need to spend money in doing. Mm. But you see other people doing to me and for me and for us. Okay. As, as a party. Mm. And so that is why people are thinking that, oh, I'm spending a lot of money. Because while other people will now have to work hard to be able to get to a certain point, for me it becomes easy. Because people see me as the one that has capacity, and so they want to be part of the process that will produce the next president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. But as far as spending, 
I mean, I'm not spending any any money that is outlandish mm. or that is excessive. I'm a lawyer, mm. and I know the limits. And certainly, I'm mm. not one that will go beyond the beyond the, the, the threshold. Yeah, uh, between 1992 and, 19, and 2015, you know, you were tempted uh, to aspire or to become governor, you know, of your home state, the Kebi state, for instance. Uh, some of the critics would say you hardly garnered 30,000 votes, you know, in all of the attempts you made. Uh, what makes you think that you can go beyond the Kebi state, you know, to seek the mandate of Nigerians? We're talking about one, 200, about 200 million people. No, it's not about any 30,000 votes, really. I contested, I attempted to contest three times. Mm. The first one was in 1996, during uh, uh, late President uh, Abacha's uh, transition program. Mm. I was a member of UNCP. Mm. My party in KB had won the local government election, mm. had won the state house of assembly election, had won the national assembly election. Mm. And we were making arrangements to go to the governorship election when he died. And then the whole process was truncated. Yeah. Then in the politics of the Fourth Republic, because our opponents mm. had gone to PDP ahead of us at that time, mm. so we also went to APP. And so I was the one who took APP to Kebbi State mm. and invited other of our colleagues to get in. So mm. naturally, winning the primaries would not be a problem for me. But there are a lot of people who felt that uh, as a lawyer, I cannot be manipulated. They felt that as a lawyer, mm. that uh, it would be difficult mm. for me to be compromised. And though they prepared other people, they thought they could compromise or mm. buy me. So I won the primary elections fair and square. Mm. When the ticket was taken, I given to somebody. Mm. I said, okay, this is the fate that God has bestowed on me. Mm. I will move on and I moved on. But mm. God had compensated me with something which was bigger than that. And that is the rank of senior advocate of Nigeria. Mm. Probably if I had become a governor then, mm. I may not have had the opportunity of going back to practice and then working to the level where I become a senior advocate of Nigeria. Mm. Then 2007, mm. 2007 because I had joined mm. PDP in 2003. Mm. By 2007, I was a PDP governorship candidate for Kedu State. Mm. I was the one that was screened by INE. My name was displayed in all the 21 local government areas in Kedu State. Mm. At that time also, Saeed so Aiken Gari mm. was also the AMPV gubernatorial candidate. He was screened by INE. Mm. And his name was displayed in all the 21 local governments of Kebbi State as the AMPV governorship candidate. Suddenly, mm. the then governor, Mohammed mm. Adamu Adelu, they come to PDP. And mm. he decamped along with Saeed Nasa Aiken Gari. Mm. And so the leadership of the party said, the governor should not be humiliated. Mm. And so we entered into an understanding mm. where my ticket was given to the AMPP candidate to run. Mm. And I consented and I agreed because if I had not consented, mm. I would have gone to court and certainly I would have gotten my ticket back and mm. I would have been the governor. Yes. And it was not only in KB that this arrangement was made, even mm. in, in Sokota State, it affected also mm. Muntari Shagari because he was the PDP flag bearer then and then the, the ticket was given to Amoku. Mm. So it's not about getting into a contest and getting out with 30,000 votes or so. Mm. And let me say also, and this is important, mm. that the fact that one had contested election three, four, five, seven times mm. and lost does not mean that one cannot contest on a higher uh, level and mm. they win election. Mm. President Buhari contested in 2003 against uh, President Olusegun and he lost. Mm. He contested in 2007 against President Yarago and lost. Mm. He contested in 2011 mm. against President uh, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan and he lost. Mm. But in 2015, mm. when a, a lot of mercenaries came <laughs> from everywhere... They called them mercenaries, everywhere. they happened to come from a political party too. Not only from a political party. Mm. Don't forget that the ACM people came don't forget that the AMPP, because he was not a member of the AMPP then, he was in CPC. Right. AMPP came, mm -hmm. ACN came, mm -hmm. PDP came, and other smaller political parties. Abga, a portion of Abga. A lot of them came. Right. So it was not mm -hmm. President Buhari winning on his own standing alone. Mm -hmm. Yes, he talked about political understanding, you know, that make you to, you know, shit ground for your, uh, the former governor of KB yes. State, uh, Leru. But then some, some are looking at... Um, you know what happened what played out at that time as um, a deliberate attempt you know or you decided on your own to trade that uh, governorship aspiration for the ministerial slot in the in the jonathan's government how true is that you see how will mm. an event that had happened mm. in 2006 have bearing in 2013 it doesn't make sense mm. this was against 2007 election. Mm. 
Right. And I became a minister mm. in 2013 after President mm. uh, uh, Erdogan yes. won an election mm. and then he died while mm. in office mm. and then President Jonathan took over, mm. went to an election and won another election again. Mm. How will anybody imagine that that arrangement yeah. that was made in 2006 mm. would persist? For the result to come out in 2013. But some say the PDP has that a way of compensating, one, compensating loyal, say, loyal members. And let me say, let me say, yes. mm. in 2007, mm. I was the chairman then of Northern Union, right. one of the most respected socio-political mm. groups in the North, right. whose membership mm. was made of highly credible and respected mm. Northern leaders, Northern right. political leaders. Mm. People like late Olushola Saraki, Hmm. People like uh, Alaji Bello Kefi, hmm. Waziri of uh, Bauchi, hmm. people like Professor Angu Abdullahi, hmm. people like Wantare Paul Inongo, yeah, people Masa like Koma hmm. and yes, people like IGP, hmm. Gamboji Meta. Hmm. I was the chairman. Hmm. And because of the role we played in hmm. the 2007 election, hmm. we were given a ministerial slot. Hmm. I was the chairperson. If I was inordinate, mm. if I was power hungry, mm. I would have grabbed it as the chairman of Northern Union mm. and I would have become a minister in 2007. Mm. But I said no. I gave that slot mm. unbelievably mm. To, to my secretary, Dr. Ibrahim Yakubalami, who mm. eventually became the Minister of Police Affairs in 2007. So mm. if I was promised, if mm. I had allowed my ticket to go to Saeed Unasa Munai Kengari mm. for the purpose of making me mm. a, a, a minister, mm. and he didn't submit my name, mm. this was another opportunity that God had brought. Mm. I would have grabbed at it, I would have made myself a minister. Right. So, some of us are not inordinate. Mm. We do not have those ambitions of, of wanting to, to hold positions. Mm. So, it wasn't about it. Right. You talked about how you, you know, you, you brought and nurture, you know, the, the APP then uh, into KB State, for yes. instance. And uh, some say because the structure was uh, ceded, if you like, to uh, the yes. then governor, I think, uh, the Madero. So mm. uh, that is why you fell out with the APC uh, and the Buhari, you know, who, is, uh, who was the leader of the party at that point in time. How true uh, was this? Well, I left APP before mm. it became ANPP. Mm. And, and at the, the time, time I left APP, I was a member of the Board of Trustees of that party. Mm. These are historical records that can be verified. Mm. But we belonged to a political family within mm. APP, and that was the Saraki group. Mm. And mm. from the way and manner mm. that late Oloi, Olushola Saraki, was changed mm. in the presidential mm. election, mm. which took place in 1998, mm. we felt agreed. We felt agreed. Mm. And so we said, okay, we will stay and see whether that party will, will rid itself of impunity, mm. whether things will be changed and sorted out. Mm. And so we stayed up till sometime in 2002, after the national convention mm. that produced Yusuf Garba Ali as the chairman of the party, mm. and led Ikemba mm. Odume Ojuku, mm. was the chairman of the BOT, and I was a member of the BOT. So we sat down mm. and then we saw the way things were moving in that party and we felt that mm. we had to leave. So it was after we left mm. that APP transmuted to AMPP mm. and that was the time that President Buhari Join. now joined the party. Mm. So it's not true. So, so you had never you know, had the opportunity of working with him in the party at, at that time? Never, not mm. in APP. Yeah, but because he was not a member of APC. Yeah, but, but then looking at the ideology, yes. you know, the APC will tell you that it's a pro pro progressive party, I mean, the, the APP uh, and all of that. But then suddenly you jumped to the, the P. Was it a kind of uh, a political suicide or you just decided to go in? You see, let me tell you one thing, and mm. that is what a lot of people don't seem to understand. Mm. In Nigeria, there's one political family. Mm. It is this family mm. that comes together when the election comes and it gets shuffled. Mm. And then people move to the left mm. and move to the right, mm. depending on what they want to, to, to contest or depending on where they've got mm. the platform and the opportunity to contest. Mm. And you've now seen it. Each time election is coming, you will mm. see a lot of movements here and there. But it's one family. Mm. Number two, as far as ideologies is concerned, mm. the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in 1999 as amended had made it mandatory. Mm. For, 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 for the, 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 every political party to have in their manifesto mm. certain key uh, provisions mm. that relates to economic uh, rights mm. and so on and so forth. Mm. So a political party mm. 
cannot be registered until it meets certain requirements within the constitution. Mm. So if you pick the manifesto mm. of any political party, any mm. one of the 101 political parties in Nigeria today, mm. you will discover that all their manifestos are substantially similar because there are certain provisions mm. that the constitution said they must comply with. So in other so words, there is no question of about ideology. Uh -huh. mm. It is just about mm. semantics. Okay. Maybe this one will say important, this one will be significant mm. in, in describing the matter. Mm. So what everything now mm. depends on the individual concern because otherwise, how will you explain mm. that people are, that, 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 that are coming from from extreme left, mm. working with people from extreme right within all the political parties in Nigeria, people whose, whose antecedents mm. have been leftist politics, mm. working with people whose antecedents have been rightist right politics. So that is the situation in Nigeria today. Right. Right. It's not about ideology. Oh, okay. Now, uh, let's look at, uh, you, you did mention that... Um, you know, the present administration and the president, Mahmoud Buhari, has been, you know, engaging in propaganda, telling Nigerians, I mean, has made promises that, is, uh, that are unrealistic, for yes. instance. What, what, how would you assess? Uh, because the government has three cardinal objectives, as it is today. Mm. Uh, reviving the economy, addressing insecurity, and, of course, fighting corruption. What's your assessment of these three cardinal objectives of the present administration? You see, in 2014, mm. in the build-up to the 2015 election, mm. APC sat down and formulated three issues. Mm. Three issues on economy, mm. on corruption, and security. on security. But what they discovered at that point in time, that Nigeria's economy was doing extremely well. Mm. Because the Nigerian economy then was mm. the fastest growing economy in Africa. It was number one mm. in Africa. Well, so they dropped that issue. Mm and concentrated on the issue of corruption mm. and on the issue of uh, security. But between these two uh, things mm. that they brought up, there are a lot of other promises that they made. Hundreds and hundreds of promises, mm. which were less with a lot of unbelievable propaganda. Mm. Now, when they now came into office, mm. some of these promises, they did not ever make in them. Some other promises, mm. they said, they were made by the by the party, not by the candidates. Mm. As if there's difference between the promise that the candidate is making mm. and the one that the party is sponsoring is making. Mm. And then even though that they own up now, some they deny. Others they say were not made by them. But the one that they own up, they've not been able to fulfill any one of them. Mm. They'll come to the major issues. Can we honestly and sincerely say that today Nigeria is more secure than when it was in at Asaj? 28th May 2015, the answer is big no. Can we say that indeed today there is less corruption mm. in the way things are done in this country than the way it was in, 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 uh, as of 28th May 2015? Again, the answer is emphatic no. If you want me to go into details, I will. The facts are there for everybody to see. Yeah. When we were in office, mm. the only security dealing we had were the remnants of the only Boko Haram issues. Mm. Which then was in the key front line sets of Yobe, mm. Mono, and Adamawa State. And it's a known fact. Even though it was holding to 14 local governments and sacking uh, formation, military formations and institutions? This is what I'm saying. Mm. I say in the three key uh, front line states. Mm. But before the election, mm. when federal government requested INE mm. to extend the time of the election so that the issue would now be addressed squarely. And indeed, the election was extended. Mm -hmm. The time was extended, and mm -hmm. the issues were addressed. And so that was the time when some of the military hardware that the federal government bought arrived. And so it was now possible for Nigerian armed forces mm -hmm. to now uh, 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 push, mm -hmm. push uh, the, the Boko Haram elements mm -hmm. to the fringes of Nigerian border yeah. with our neighbors. So it wasn't so, the relocation of the, 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 the command center and, and the, the, the restructuring within the no, hierarchy? No, the relocation of the command center had no effect. Mm. Has the command center not been relocated now? Has the, how many military bases are, have been captured now by Boko Haram regrouping together? Mm. So it has nothing to do with it. So what we were expecting was that APC-led mm. federal government coming in will just mm. mop up the remnants of the Boko Haram element. But what mm. did they have do? They didn't do that. Instead, they allowed them to regroup. Mm. Instead, they allowed them to rearm and recruit themselves with the money that the federal government under APC was giving them as a ransom. Mm. 
Today, the situation there is worse than what it was by 28th May 2015 when they took over. And that is not even the aspect of it that pains me. Oh. Federal government will look at Nigerians living in this key front line cell and say Boko Haram has been degraded, they have been defeated. Oh. And then these people there will relax only for them to be killed as sub targets by, by, by the Boko Haram who are now regrouping and who are now again inching further and further into Nigerian territory and they cannot do anything. And oh. that was the situation. That was the challenge as of 2015. But what are the other security challenges that we have today? Every day, mm. every God blessed day, mm. as a result of the harders and farmers clashes, mm. hundreds and hundreds of Nigerians get killed in Plateau, in Benue, in Nasarawa, in Koji, and Adama, in Taraba, and in some parts of southwest and southeast south, south of this country. Mm. Every day, mm. hundreds and hundreds of Nigerians get killed in Katsina, in Zamfara, in Kaduna, mm. in Niger. And now it is extending to Zamora and Kemisa as a result of the activities of bandits. But as part I'm of not the, even talking. I, I, yes. I'm not even talking about the issues of mm. kidnapping. Yes. That are made Nigerians more vulnerable than any other time. Yeah, but as so part can you can yeah. you honestly mm. say mm. that there is more security today? Nigerians are secured more more secured than today than they were in, 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 in May 20, 2015? No. Yeah, but as part within the security cycle will tell you that uh, you know most of these internal security uh, uh, challenges we're talking about are byproducts of the Boko Haram insurgency. Uh, most of the insurgents have moved in in what? Of course, they have to survive. So it is the Boko Haram elements now mm. that are masquerading as cattle riaras. Mm. They are the ones that are now cattle herders. Mm. If you even consider that, what does not make sense, will you also say that the bandits mm. that are operating in the Northwest are also remnants of the Boko Haram elements? which is unbelievable. If you even accept that, will you also say that the kidnappers now, that are kidnapping people left, right and centre, they are also Boko Haram elements? Hmm. It wouldn't it will, it will make sense. Well, you talked about, you know, handing over a sound economy to, the, to the present administration. But, but shortly after you left the scene, you know, the economy plunged into recession. Uh, the government said you have failed to, I mean, to, to save, you know, for the rainy days. Uh, all prices have crashed, and of course the economy has to go into recession. There are no buffers, you know, the, the foreign reserve has been depleted and all of that. How would you blame the present administration on the economic quagmire? It's not about uh, plummeting of the oil prices. Again, that is another cheap propaganda mm. that the APC left for government is talking about. Mm. No government mm. create wealth or raise money to keep for another Governments all over, mm. they, 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 they make money mm. to, 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 to drive their programs. Mm. So this is not the first time that the prices of oil had gone down. We've seen how oil, even when PDP was in government, had gone down and gone up at different times. But it's about consistency, it's mm. about vision, it's mm. about programs. Mm. It's about the political will mm. to drive those programs, which this government does not have. Our economy started shaking and got into a lot of uh, turbulence mm. when APC came without any economic team, without chief economic advisor. And this is the first time since our independence where we get a government that does not have a chief economic advisor, that does not have an economic team. Even if the president were an economist, he would still need another person to, to have the benefit of his second opinion. Why will our economy not go down? Again, you, you, you come in, Mm. You've started with a lot of policy somersaults. Today you say this, tomorrow you say that, in such a way and manner as to, 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 to create lack of confidence in the system. People will leave, and people left. Mm. It is a fact that a lot of investors in Nigeria today have left. Even local investors, Nigerians, mm. who were convinced through well-articulated programs mm. by PDP successive federal governments to come back into Nigeria, mm. believe in Nigeria, key into what probably, uh, Nigeria was doing. Mm. And that was why these people not only came back, but they brought their hard and monies. And that was the period where you saw the highest influx of foreign direct investment. Mm. Is anybody coming to Nigeria to invest now? No. Even Are Nigerians even investing in Nigeria? Mm. No. Even A lot of them have left even to, to Ghana, to <laughs> South Africa, to mm. Niger, to Cameroon and Chad. Mm. And those that have made the mistake of not leaving, mm. Chances are if at the 28th May mm. 2015 you had an investment or a business concern that is worth 1 million, mm. chances by now is that it's less than 100,000. Mm. It's been deflated. Even with the ease of doing business that the government has been talking with about. Which ease of doing business? We've got the ease of doing business. We're the one who liberalized the landscape. 
and made it possible for you as an investor to come today and then all the regulatory requirements will be give will be will be, will be, will be, will be, will be met today. You will today come in, register a company, if it's a business that needs an expansion mm. quota, you'll get it and so on and so forth. And then if by tomorrow mm. you want to leave, you will pack your money with the interest or or, 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 or the earnings on it and leave. Mm. When they came, what did they do? They said all operations in the domiciliary account were frozen. Because of that, there were issues with a lot of foreign airlines that were operating in Nigeria. They were selling, they could not repatriate their funds back. A lot of them had to stop operating in Nigeria. Because they were targeting certain people they thought had foreign currencies. Mm -hmm. Probably those of us who were living government then. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people had opened domiciliary accounts for mm -hmm. it to make it possible for them to pay school fees of their children and wards mm -hmm. that were schooling abroad. Mm -hmm. Some were uh, saving mm -hmm. for medical tourism. When they came, they discovered that instead of now targeting the selected group within PDP that they told they were going to deal with, mm -hmm. they end up visiting a lot of iniquities on all Nigerians. Mm -hmm. And by the time they now attempted to reverse it, mm -hmm. a lot of harm But didn't done. they succeed somehow because they were able to track some of the funds, you know, that are still left in the treasury, I mean, in, in some of the banks, uh, you know, unaccounted. Anyway. <laughs> Which funds? <laughs> Well, I guess it's just joining us. It's, uh, it's guest of the week. And of course, uh, our guest uh, today on the platform is Baris Takabir Tanimo a senior advocate of Nigeria, Dodama Senum Gundu and Zaruman Kabi, a former minister of special duties, and of course, chairman of the Forum of PDP Ministers. Together, we've been interfacing on the platform, guest of the week. Uh, 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 we have to take a short break here. Uh, please don't go away. We're back in a short while. Government has no business with business. TV to actually uh, explain what exactly the British government. Without peace, without security, nothing else happens. You can't even go to a mosque or church. We have a lot of work on it and we are determined to continue with our focus. We are our thinking as a work for the people. That's what the government should do. Provide facilities and infrastructure for the people so that they can develop themselves. All right, thank you for staying with us uh, on uh, uh, Guest of the Week. Uh, our viewers uh, on Liberty Television and of course those listening to us uh, on 91.7 our sister station uh, if, in case you're just joining us we've been talking with uh, Barista Kabiru Tanimu Turaiki a senior advocate of Nigeria Damasen Ngwandu Zaru Mankabi and of course former Minister of Special Duties and Chairman of the Forum of uh, PDP uh, former PDP Ministers uh, thank you for uh, remaining with us on the platform uh, thank you for coming back thank you very much Yes, uh, you know, you are one of the frontline presidential aspirants of the PDP. Uh, before now, the PDP was said to be in intensive care, you know, after the 2015 general elections, after that defeat. But uh, some of you, you know, stayed in the party and, of course, uh, made it possible today for a number of, uh, you know, uh, chieftains who have left the party to also return. Today, you are aspiring to be one of the, pre I mean, to, to get a ticket of the presidential uh, candidacy of the PDP. Uh, what exactly do you have in stock? Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, it is true that uh, PDP had gone through uh, thick and thin, and thank God uh, we pulled out of the woods. And today is a new rebranded party that is uh, gathering support and confidence of Nigerians. Now, yes, again, I'm one of the aspirants, and uh, if by the special grace of God, I get the ticket and I win election, the first thing that I will have to tackle is the issue of insecurity in this country, because insecurity is the greatest problem that is facing us now. I have said, never in our history have Nigerians been so vulnerable. You are not safe in your home, you are not safe on the street, you are not safe in a place of work. And yet we know that the irreducible minimum obligation of every government anywhere in the world, whether it is democratic or autocratic or whatever, is to ensure that the lives and properties of the citizens are protected 247. Now, when in 2015, APC formulated the issue of security as one of the campaign issues, the situation is not as bad as it is today. Now, the situation had continued to worsen because the APC-led federal government has not been able to come up with a robust security architecture that would be able 
to now protect the lives and properties of Nigerians. And indeed, even if there is one, that there is no way the APC-led federal government will implement it. Because the security agencies under APC are working at cross-purposes. They are not developing uh, cooperation. They are not developing synergy to be able for them to, to come or implement a, a security architecture that will give us it where that cover to Nigerians. Now, they cannot do that because, like I said, they are working at cross purposes. This so much had been ad admitted to by, by, by the National Security Advisor about two months ago when he appeared before the Senate. He admitted that, that they are overwhelmed by the insecurity social in this country because they are working at cross purposes. But yes, anybody who knows anything about security and, uh, or insecurity will know that. Where security agencies behave in the way and manner that they try to squatle each other like they are doing now, that certainly nothing good will come out of it. An agency may be good at information gathering. Another may be good at analyzing that information that has been gathered. Yet another one will be good at providing solutions. Yet you will get another agency where it will be excellently good in implementing the recommendations. So unless therefore there is that synergy, that they will not be able to do that. Number two, this government has refused to look at other credible reports that contain credible recommendations that will have assisted them in solving the spate of a lot of insecurity issues in this country today. I could recall as the chairman of the Presidential Committee on Dialogue, we've been able to come up with robust recommendations that went beyond curbing the issue of insecurity in this country. But we look at all other issues, including the farmers' hardest clashes, and so on and so forth. So if all that this government had done was to implement that report, that most of the issues of insecurity in this country will have been solved. When I get there, I will ensure that I revisit that report and then see how to implement those recommendations as part of my strategy and ensuring that, of course, there is going to be security in this country. But above all, you need a commander-in-chief that has the political will, that has the strong character to be able to drive some of these policies through. And I have that strength of character. And I have that, that political will. So I will be able to do it. Now, beyond that, the next thing that one has to look at will be the economy. Again, by May 28th, when we are making arrangements to hand over power to APC, the Nigerian economy was number one. But through policy somersault and a lot of other things that had happened, which I have already st stated earlier on in this, in this discussion, the, the economy has gone down now. I will use my private sector background. I will use my experience both in private sector and government to raise a very credible economic team that will look at those policies that PDP-led federal governments from 1999 to 2015 had done, mm. brush them because of the dynamism of life, mm. and then reject the economy, and then bring sense of purposefulness into the system, so that businesses again will begin to grow, and they will begin to create and grow wealth. And then we will now convince Nigerians through the same process we've done before, to begin to believe themselves and believe in their country and come back. Because unless Nigerians begin to believe and invest in Nigeria, we will not expect other foreigners or other nationals mm. to begin to come and invest here. So we will reject the economy. We will turn it around. Mm. We will bring back the days of prosperity. Mm. We will ensure that there is employment mm. to a team in unemployed Nigeria. But it's not just about employment. This APC-led federal government, when they were campaigning in 2015, mm. they said they are going to create 2 million jobs every year. Mm. Not only were they not able to create one single job, but indeed, they made a lot of people lose jobs because a lot of businesses have folded and left. A lot of people have downsized and downscaled their businesses. But they will tell you they are, a lot of retrenchment. they are creating a lot of uh, you know employment opportunities in the agricultural sector, which in the was hidden to in. In the agricultural sector, I will tell you mm. what are they doing. In your state in Kebi, for instance, the, the farm, the rice revolution. It was not APC. This was the PDP-led uh, 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 policies. Mm. This was a PDP program mm. that they came and, and, and climbed on. Every acre or hectare of land that is cultivated in Kebi today was a hectare or, or, or acre that was being cultivated when we were there. Indeed, go into the field and ask these farmers. They were getting more support when PDP was there than what is happening today. The so-called uncle borrowers came is a fraud. 
Let them let the federal government idea them. Let them go and investigate. Hmm. The Anko Brower scheme today is a fraud. People in, in, in central bank they know it. People in, in hmm. government where the, the, the programs is being implemented know it, but they are scared because high profile individuals are involved in this in, in these acts of corruption. So hmm. that is a fact. Hmm. When I get there as a president, by the special grace of God, also hmm. I will look at the issue of rule of law. Yes, I, I, I want to take they, you actually yes. on that because Mr. President has recently made a, a statement, and uh, as a call, as a legal practitioner, uh, a professional, you know, uh, in that in that field, he talks about you know uh, subordinating rule of law to national uh, interest or national security. What's your take on that? I've said my view as far as that issue is concerned. How do you subordinate rule of law to national security? Who determines what national security is? Who determines what national interest is at any given point in time? It's something that will be subjected to the whims and caprices of the people concerned. No democracy will allow that. No decent and civilized society will allow that to happen. Nigeria, for goodness sake, is a constitutional democracy. They came as a result of the provisions of the constitution and other extant legislation that drive their, 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 their strength and character from the constitution. And now you are now coming to say, okay, you want to subordinate the rule of law, the will of the people to your own selfish, narrow-minded conclusion of what is the national interest. It will not work. It's like that uh, executive order number six that they did with a view to hunting opposition leaders, particularly members of uh, PDP. Yeah. It wouldn't work. Is it about it which hunting? Because Mr. President said he, he was doing that to safeguard, you know, uh, that public resources or public uh, funds. When he left in, 20, in 1984, you know, most, of, most of the monies he was able to recover were shared back to the, to to the owners. To, to, save, to safeguard uh, the national assets. Why, why, why is he not uh, safeguarding the, 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 the properties of IDPs? Haven't we seen how an individual took 200 million naira to go and uh, IDP funds to, to, to go and cut grass in the Sahara? What of the monumental fraud that is taking place in, 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 uh, NMPC? What of the, uh, the abuse of, of the, this thing for, for foreign exchange that is taking place in CBN? Why are they not looking at these things? They want to save, uh, uh, national assets. They want to save national assets. The Abacha loot that was recovered, they said they are now not saving it. They want to go and give it to poor Nigerian families. That How are you determining which families are poor? I can say I'm poor because I'm poorer than what I was before APC came into government. And many Nigerian families, many Nigerian businessmen, and owners of businesses are poorer than, 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 than they, they were before 2015. So are they now saying that they are going to give us that money to share also? It's something that people create deliberately to subvert and manipulate the system and take advantage. And that is why we're saying no. Governance shouldn't be about yourself. Governance shouldn't be about those people that are members of your family. Governance shouldn't be about those who are members of your clan. Governance shouldn't be about those people who surround you and then continue to tell you all kind of lies. It's not about that. Yeah, but Nigerians are keying into this fight against corruption, which... Uh, which fight? Y y y uh, what, which what, fight? Do you intend to sustain it? Or how do you think you can approach there it? There was fight against corruption. There is no fight against corruption today. If anything, corruption today is working on its legs. It is today that Nigerians have seen what is corruption. Let me tell you one thing. All this corruption that people have been talking about, corruption never started with PDP. Corruption had been there. Let people go back into history. But it was a PDP while in government that sat down and took a holistic approach to a fight against corruption. Who established EFCC? PDP. Who established ICPC? PDP. Who strengthened the Code of Conduct Tribunal? PDP. Who, who created the Freedom of Information Act? PDP. Who brought the, 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 a lot of other regulatory provisions? including the uh, due process in, in a word of contrast in government. PDP. But it was thriving, you know. At when some point it was even seen not I'm to be... I'm coming. A... Right. I'm coming. I'm coming. When we did this thing, we did not only enable them, we strengthened them, we gave them capacity, and we started looking inwards. We were investigating ourselves. Because if at that time we said, okay, let us begin to investigate opposition leaders, we will have been accused of witch hunting like they are doing today. What are they doing today? You'll be accused of monumental corruption as soon as you, they come to your house 
and they see a big broom, they say, oh, you should have told us that you have a broom in your house. And that is the end of the matter. We have seen people who were investigated and were being prosecuted by PDP led federal government then. And as soon as they cross over, those charges against them were dropped. Those cases are withdrawn. We've seen it. Even today, you'll be accused of being a looter if you are in PDP. As soon as you come, they will embrace you and then use the broom to clean you. Is that how to fight corruption? Yes, you will tell it is investigating whoever cross capital. It doesn't matter. No. And then people within that the is sheer baloney. That is sheer baloney. We know that. That is sheer baloney. What? Why have they not been able to investigate any PDP governor today? Why have they not been able to investigate any single APC minister today? Why have they not been able to investigate any chairman of a parastatal who is a member of APC or any other MDA? They have not done that. While we were there, governors who had held offices as PDP governors for eight years were being investigated. And it is on record. The only two really meaningful convictions that AFC, AFCC had acquired were those of Dari and those of Jolly Inyami. And these are the cases that were tried, were started by PDP. Tell me, which of the APC governors are they investigating? Which of the APC ministers today? And there has been several allegations of monumental corruption in this government. They are not doing that. Is that how to fight corruption? You, 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 you try people on the pages of newspaper, and then when eventually they get to court, the court discharge and acquit them at some level. The court will even say that there is no case that has been made out against them for them to even enter a defense. This is your constituency. Are you saying that some things are still wrong in the, in the judiciary? Not in the judiciary, yes. but in the way and manner the, this federal government is fighting corruption. Because ideally, what you need to do, before you impugn the character of individuals, before you assassinate their character, you make sure you do your homework well. Gather your facts. When you get enough facts that you think will sustain a trial in a court of law, then you invite them and confront them with these facts. If they explain it, that's the end of it. If they don't, then you go to court and determine whether or not indeed there's a prima facie case for the trial to continue. They don't do that. We've seen how they were able to break into the houses of senior ju 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 jurists in a commando-like manner and accuse them of monumental corruption. What happened at the end of the day? I'm coming. I'm coming. What happened at the end of the day? One of them, they took him to court after destroying his reputation. At the point of no case submission, court said, go home. There's nothing against you. He's gone home, but he's been ruined. They have made him to go through a lot of psychological trauma, which can never be compensated. At the end of the day, what did that judge do? He threw in the towel and left. Left with his head bowed down. There is another justice of the Supreme Court. They accuse him of a lot of financial improprieties and corruption. What happened at the end of the day? The only thing that they could get against him was that he has two passports. I'm not saying that two passports may not be an offense under the Immigration Act. But certainly, with my knowledge as a lawyer, I know having two passports does not amount to a financial crime. So, but they have maligned him. They've destroyed him, assassinated his character on the pages of newspaper. And this is a very senior judge who had sacrificed everything he had in his life in the development of this country. How do you compensate him? And they were doing this thing because the executive arm of government under APC wants to cow all other arms. They were intimidating the legislature and they were intimidating the judiciary. Is that how government is run? What happened to the principle of suppression of power? And that is why we in PDP were saying, no, this is not the way things are, are, are done on other places. This is not what we did. And that is why Nigerians also are saying, look, we have now found ourselves in a situation where the only saving uh, grace will be PDP. And that is why we are, we are bracing up to take over power by the special grace of God in, tw in 2019. I, you must have learned your mistakes, of, I mean the mistakes, and then want to correct them. Certainly. Because you agree that there are a lot of... Certainly. You see, PDP had gone through a lot had gone through every kind of thing that any political party could go into. The first word, having been in power for 16 years and then losing an election. And then number two, there was a leadership crisis by some mercenaries that were sent to us again to cause crisis in our party. For 16 or 18 months, we fought to take back the control of the soul of our party. So we've gone through everything that any political party could go to. And we've garnered a lot of experience. And this experience we intend to use moving forward. But that is not even the issue. Talking about mistakes, we're human beings. 
And because our human beings were not infallible. And that is why we've admitted, yes, there were situations when we made mistakes. But make no doubt about it. These were honest and genuine mistakes. We owned up and we've moved up. We've learned our lessons from those mistakes we've made. And when now, by the special grace of God, we come back into power, we'll avoid those pitfalls. We'll not repeat those mistakes because we've now learned from them. And we will do those things that have endeared us to the minds of Nigeria, even quadruple them and move forward. But the problem with APC is that APC will never admit that they are, they are, they are humans, that they make mistakes. Even when they make mistakes, they try to shift the blame. No, it's not the president. No, it's not the minister. No, it's this or it's that. Today, a person's wife will have miscarried. They will say it's because PDP stole money. <laughs> that is the situation that they've reduced this country into yeah. and governors. You have a little masters, you know, ahead of you. Uh, the coming together, you know, of this about 12 presidential aspirants all coming to, I mean, to take the ticket of the, the PDP. How do you think it's going to play out? Because uh, there has been a lot of, uh, you know, misgivings and, of course, apprehension, even within the, the aspirants themselves. Recently, one of them was talking about the need for the party to insist that, you know, uh, those who have been in the party, who have not decamped, who have worked for the, for the return of the party to limelight, sh should be, you know, given consideration. Others who are just coming in to aspire and things like that. And then they're also cautioning against giving the tickets to the money bags who may come to intimidate others. How do you think it's going to play out, you know, the, 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 the party, the presidential primaries of the PDP? Well, I do not share some of this thinking that some people have that because there are a lot of aspirants that the process is going to be a bit uh, contentious. I, I don't share that view. Number one, all the aspirants that we have in PDP today are men of high integrity, are people that are eminently qualified to become Nigerian president, and when they do, to do 1,000 times better than what APC is doing today. Number two, PDP had zoned the presidency to the north. And so what we want to produce is not a northern president. We want to produce a Nigerian president of northern extraction. And given the challenges ahead that will come in 2019 election, we want to bring the best. And if we want to bring the best, then certainly we must liberalize the landscape. We must open it up. We must give more people opportunity of coming back and coming into the race. At the end of the day, delegates in PDP will have a wild attitude, attitude of taste, choice to look at the antecedents, to look at the pedigree, to look at the standing and character of the candidates. Who is it that will not only beat the candidates that other political parties are going to bring, but will win the election? Who is it that will now uh, be able to earn the trust and confidence of Nigerians. Who is it that will be able to unite Nigeria and bring back that friendship, that sisterhood that had been existing amongst us as a people that are replete with multiplicity of ethnicity and pluralities and complexities? That is important. So for us, yes, I am aware that some APC gladiators are, are laying ambush thinking that they will even encourage crisis in the process of selection of our candidate in such a way and manner as to get some other people to go back into, into their fold or benefit from it. But I tell them that they will be disappointed at the end of the day. All of us have been talking to each other and talking to ourselves. We've agreed that power comes from God. And because power comes from God, we know that at any point in time, only one person will be president. So any person who gets this among us, you will not see the acrimony here and there. We will line up behind that person, support him, go out in the, to, to, to the campaign for him. There's an attempt, you know, to, to, to get at a consensus candidate, perhaps. Uh, but some of the, 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 the presidential aspirants have already begun to express their position that they are not, you know, interested in any uh, consensus, that there should be a level playing ground, that the, the contest should be open to all. Do you believe it? No, you know, it's not like that. There is no aspirant in any political party contesting for any office that will tell you he, he or she is averse to consensus. No. But what people are saying that they are averse to force consensus. Things should be allowed to work out naturally. We've been speaking to ourselves and we've been speaking to each other. If for whatever reason, for instance, we get to a point where anyone of us feel that, well, for this particular reason, I want to go 
and I am only to exit from this contest. Nobody will insist that, well, having bought from you, you must go into it. There are some people who will now also drop from the contest on the day of the convention. Some of them at the, at, at the convention venue. Now we are talking to ourselves. We certainly will get to a certain level where some of us will feel that, well, so as not to overheat the, the polity and overheat the landscape, that they may step down. And whether they are doing this for others or they are just stepping down wouldn't make a sense. But whether we are able to get a consensus through understanding amongst the aspirants or we get to the primaries at the end of the day and then we we'll select our candidate, I tell you it's going to be rancor free. I tell you at the end of the day, we will come together as friends, as leaders of the party, who are conscious of our responsibility, not just to our party, but indeed to, 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 to Nigerian Federation. Because today, Nigerians see PDP as the only party that will save Nigeria from imminent collapse. Other political parties see Nigeria, I mean see PDP, as the one that will now become the flagship for the crusade to save Nigeria from collapse. So if this is the case, then it's not about us. It shouldn't even be about PDB, it should be about Nigeria. And so we're not losing focus. We're looking at the issues, remaining conscious of our responsibilities to our country as patriots. And that will not disappoint Nigerians by the special grace of God. Yes, uh, you happen to be, uh, you know, about the only candidate that so far has traversed Nigeria, have gone around, you know, the states. What do you think stands you out? Well... I think there are a lot of things. Let me say that there are all, almost all other aspirants are also moving, but certainly I'm far ahead as far as coverage of the, 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 the ground is concerned. There is no doubt about it. Uh, I said all the aspirants are eminently qualified. They are good. But in a contest like this, where you are going to meet a lot of gladiators from other political parties, you do not settle for the best. You settle for the bestest best. And so what I'm saying now, what stands me out and may eventually give me opportunity and advantage in the final uh, contest is my integrity, my credibility, my character, my knowledge and experience. I'm a person that has no baggage at all. I'm a person that is clean. I have, my activities have been investigated. I know any unwholesome activity had been found against me or traced to me. That is something that Nigerians will want to hear at this critical time also. Then, I have a lot of dynamism arising from my age, my usefulness. And certainly, the global practice today is leaning towards getting younger persons who have a lot of energy and who bring a lot of dynamism in the art of governance. Because today, the world is a global village. And so people will see what you are doing, just like you are seeing what you are, what others are doing. Look at most of the, 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 the people that have been elected today in even developed countries. There are people that are either my age or a little below my age. So I have that advantage. Mm. In other words, you are, you are compliant. I am. Certainly I am. And then you, you need a person that is a bridge builder. Somebody who will be able to build strong bridges of friendship across the various divide. Because never in our political history since our independence have Nigerians found ourselves in a position where we are so divided among many lines. So we need a person that will be able to now build these bridges and bring us back together. We used to say, Though tribe and tongue may differ in our national, old national anthem, that in brotherhood we stand. But we want to rekindle that fire and spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood in Nigeria, where we can work together. I have that advantage. Beyond this, I'm cosmopolitan. And so because of my cosmo cosmopolitan nature, so I will find it difficult to easily blend and allow people also to blend with each other. I have that advantage. I have... I do not have... Uh, any controversy around me. I'm not fighting anybody. Nobody is fighting me. So if by the time I become PDP candidate, I wouldn't need anybody to start making peace between me and other aspirants or other leaders or other gladiators whose support is critical and will be needed in, 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 in the fight to, to, to rescue Nigeria uh, in, in 2019. So these are some of the things. I am 
also a person that has the fear of God at heart. And moving forward, we will need a leader that is godly. A leader that will be able to look at Nigerians and say yes, and his yes will be yes. A leader that will not discriminate against the citizens. A leader that will not be nepotistic and despotic. A leader that will have respect for rule of law. Because I, 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 I mean, surrounding the agitations hmm. of, of, of ethnic groups in this country, hmm. including issue of restructuring, hmm. I have the capacity again. Hmm. I have the strong political will. Hmm. So if it is about resource control of uh, true federalism, hmm. who is not only a lawyer, but indeed a senior advocate of Nigeria. And this will bring me to a situation where I will then seek out to look at other very critical issues that have been uh, 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 I mean surrounding the agitations of, of, of ethnic groups in this country, including issue of restructuring. I have the capacity again. I have the strong political will. So if it is about resource control of uh, true federalism, Nigerians will believe me because I'm a lawyer and I will drive the process. I will be able to navigate through all the murky storms and then come out with a, a, something that will ensure fairness and equity to all, to, to, to all Nigerian people. Thank you. Come here with another interesting personality. Until then, I'm Shapiro Suleiman. Enjoy the rest of your day.